Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today, we have Mark Jacobson, founder and CEO of Terrain Analytics, a strategic workforce analytics data platform, helping companies find the best market to hire the best people anywhere in the world. Mark, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm so excited, not only from your journey and, and where, what brought you to, to Terrain Analytics now and, and building a company, but also your insight into, I think, what a lot of people care about, which is data and, and in, in many different ways, people are utilizing it. Founders are utilizing to give people insights, other founders or companies the like on what to do or actions to take. So it's always exciting about the founders like yourself who have a particular eye into a market and, and really a wealth of knowledge into that particular space. But before we get started on terrain analytics and, and what brought you here, what were you doing before you started the company? Well, first off, thanks very much for inviting me to be on your podcast. I really appreciate it. So I get the conversation. So what the prompted me to start Terrain was I'm a serial entrepreneur at heart. I've been involved in the startup community for a long time. And really I'd started a lot of service companies before. So yeah. Terrain is the first software company that I've started. And I did it because I just felt there was opportunities that I'd seen where there were a lot of questions being asked by mm -hmm. companies, by my clients over time, even just kind of hearsay where they were kind of itching at the same, they're trying to scratch the same problem, right? Of like, how do I solve a talent related problem in a better way. And so truthfully, we experimented with some ideas, but the, the catalyst kind of took me back to early in my career. Yeah. I was a grunt working at a law firm and we were working on really, really fun deals at the time. Some of the largest venture financing M&A deals, the largest IPO at that time. And it was the star power of um, entrepreneurs that really kind of spoke to me. I grew up in LA. I worked in Hollywood agencies in summers and kind of saw a similar dynamic of kind of everything yeah. revolving around this kind of individual or group of individuals. And so early in my career, I heard the saying, invest in A people with a B idea over an A idea with B people. And yeah. when I went to college and did the business plan competitions, it was the opposite. It was always like, well, you were sitting there voting on like, well, what's the best idea? Like, yeah. Nobody in that room was qualified to like do the thing. So it didn't really matter. But I just found that really fascinating. Like this was just common wisdom. Like you just simply yeah. invested in the A people and you let them figure it out. The idea didn't matter. There were pivots, there was other stuff. Yeah. And so I kind of just always centered on talent because I knew that if I was central to talent, if I was connected to talent, I would be around great ideas. I would be around great innovation. And that just kind of interested me. Along the way, companies were always trying to solve the talent problem. Since 1997, yeah. we've been in the war for talent. And the tools are getting better for like ATS. The tools are getting better for DEI. They're getting better for culture. But how you actually strategically plan for talent was noticeably absent. And I yeah. think that in a post-pandemic world where talent is more distributed now than ever, everything like the Andy is up, right? Trying to find people, trying to recruit people, trying to retain people. It's yeah. just gotten more complicated. You need systems to do what humans have naturally done. You can't yeah. tell me the difference between Dallas and Denver or Dublin and Zurich. People don't know, right? It's always experiential. And someone says, well, like mm -hmm. my founder worked here, my CTO worked there, my board member worked there, Google opened an office there, Facebook is there. There's all this like anecdotal evidence that goes around. And so really what we wanted to do with Terrain was to say, there's a, a data-driven way to make better decisions around how you hire and retain and accomplish your hiring goals. So yeah. that was, that was the impetus. That's why we started train. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to jump right on into to talent. I, obviously I, I have a little bit of that running a, a two-sided marketplace with talent, but I, I'm interested in the, the transition from service to then software platform, because mm -hmm. it is so interesting to see the, you see, you see, you see key insights throughout your experiences and then, and then you build a software around it, but what a particular was the difficulty around that transition and, and what was changing in terms of the customers you were chatting with and the, the conversations you were having going from services to platform and, and j just for what it's worth, you've had a, quite a few founders on here going through that transition and all have experienced different hurdles during that transition period. What, what in particular was challenging for you moving in that direction? And I guess also what was surprising to you about a process or, or an aspect of the business that was maybe easier than you as, had expected? Great question. And probably more challenges than I ever imagined. 
my prior experience, I had always started companies where I had some relevant experience. I could do the recruiting, I could do the selling, I could build the company, I could run the finances. The transition from service to software was a tough one because I needed a co-founder. Uh, yeah. I needed a technical co-founder. And so step one was not just identifying the idea, but it was finding the right person that would be a good compliment to me that I could get along with. And so I was really lucky to find my co-founder, Riley. He's just absolutely amazing. And we've been through a lot. So like our ability to work through challenges, to have good conversations, challenging conversations, push one another, push back on one another. I think we do it in a really healthy way. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've worked together for many, many years. So hopefully he'd say the same thing. <laughs> um, but uh, so identifying your co-founder is one thing, understanding what you're great at doing and what you're not going to do. I think one of the recipes for Riley and I is like, we don't step on each other's toes. Yeah. He's got a very clear lane that he owns. I've got a very clear lane that I own. We're constantly talking and working together, but we're never trying to like duplicate. We don't really like undermine each other either. And so I know a lot of founders can get into like founder arguments and we just really haven't had that many. So that's been... That's been good. Another thing was just how did we settle on the idea? We had multiple ideas, like workforce analytics was not our starting idea. We actually worked through two or three other ideas. And so we bootstrapped before we ever raised any money. And so that was kind of a novel concept too. We didn't go through a YC program. We didn't go through an accelerator program. We didn't have grants. We bootstrapped. We actually had to go find customers that would pay for us to figure out the ideas. So that ended up being our starting point, which is a little bit more non-traditional, I guess. I mm -hmm. started a little bit more project-based. We really wanted to be certain that we were solving a pain point before we went and built a company around something that we thought was just interesting. Yeah. And so there in lied like a number of iterations as well. And so we had our aha moment. We can get into that if you want, but it was really centered around like the Amazon HQ2 RFP. And we just thought, wow, this is a really meaningful opportunity. We think we can solve it. So we went and we found paying customers. We solved it for them. And then we began the process of making a scalable, a repeatable process, and then moving that into being a software-driven business. So our, our arc has been a little bit atypical. Yeah. I know a lot of founders are technical and a lot start with kind of software day one. We actually built a business. We had revenue. And so we've moved in to kind of yeah. complement our skills and what we're able to do. Yeah. Maybe this ties into the aha moment, but what in particular, if I'm thinking about your journey, why, why not find a way to provide them the talent in those particular areas versus allow them the, the information and tools to do that themselves? But it's like, rather than finding them a bunch of fish and a, you're pretty much teaching them how to send the reel out there and, and you know, how to, how to cast and, and fish for themselves. What was the, I guess, maybe what was the catalyst to shifting your mindset into, okay, we're not going to provide talent, but we're going to provide a solution for them to go hire individuals themselves. What was that moment like? I think the, I think the finding them talent part is the thing where there's a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of agencies. There's a lot of tech enabled vendors. There's ATS systems. Like there's a lot that's been invested in, in the HR tech space specifically designed to get you to talent. So how you get it, the way you track it, the way you retain, those things were really, really well covered. And we felt that if we were going to do anything different, we had to find the, the greenfield space. And so for us, what we realized is not only is the talent acquisition part pretty well covered, the internal planning is also pretty well covered. So you have large players like Workday, People Analytics is covered. You've got really, really strong vendors where they've got internal company data. We realized that the opportunity was external market data. It was things that companies didn't already know, and there were huge gaps. It was also a tremendous spend that yeah. really was a little bit not obvious. Like you don't think how much you really spend on talent every year relative yeah. to what you pay for software, relative to what you pay for real estate, but it ends up being absolutely enormous. And so we felt that this would make a material difference to a company when they say, how do I pick the market I'm going to go be in? Because there's discovery, there's, there's search costs there. Then you have mm -hmm. to go out and recruit. Then you have to find the people. Then you have to think about real estate. Then you got to retain them. So there's all these components that go into the math and the equation of mm -hmm. what does it cost to attract and rich talent? And we thought if you set that up wrong, it is an incredibly expensive error that you make. And it's really hard to get out of it. So if you can go find 
better markets. You can retain people. You can acquire them better, different levels of competition, improve your DEI, like think about how you yeah. build your business. We didn't hear anybody talking about that. Yeah. And the existing tools were, are pretty archaic. Like we're competing with people that want to build their own spreadsheets or that are relying on census data. Yeah. That's where we felt, hey, that's great. We can make a material difference. We're not competing with everyone building AI and ML. The market just looked much more attractive to us. So that's why we picked yeah. the selection we made. Yeah. And what, what are some, out of curiosity, what are some common trends you see in terms of where companies are looking to build out teams? And what are some of the, I guess, challenges, but benefits of having remote teams nowadays, not necessarily needing them in a physical location, but needing them essentially in, in an aggregate location, maybe if it's for meeting up or, or maybe understanding the fundamentals of, of that area and logistics, if it's like a certain type of software or what have you, that, that need make government and compliance involvement. What are some trends on, on where people are building and how are they building in a remote kind of almost a remote first culture nowadays? Yeah. So the world has been so fluid since we started this because we started yeah. before work from home went into play, everything went all remote. So everyone thought, okay, the office is dead. I, I don't need to worry about location whatsoever. And it's not really a, a totally true narrative. What we've learned is that companies of certain industries and sizes are more likely to embrace all remote. And that's great. There are a lot of companies that simply can't do that. So biotech, pharma companies, they cannot be all remote. If you're in manufacturing or hardware, you cannot be all remote. Mm -hmm. uh, there are large companies that have more than 10 offices globally. And they're thinking about the impact of where their talent is and what happens if war breaks out in Eastern Europe. There's a lot of different dynamics that come to play where a continuous planning model really matters. And so you may yeah. be saying, well, I want to do labor arbitrage. I don't want to recruit in San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Austin, because it's so expensive. I need to find lower cost markets where I can still get exceptional talent. Yeah. The, the cost of discovery is massive we believe. And yeah. so then being able to tell the difference between what's happening in biotech in the UK versus Switzerland versus in Asia or Latin America, you cannot extract this information anywhere easily. And mm -hmm. so you're really at a loss. And again, that investment in talent is so we look at it like this is a, a very fluid conversation where you're starting to see companies bring employees back to the office. Amazon's announced it. Snap has announced it. Google's announced it. Salesforce has announced it. All the yeah. bellwethers that said we're fully remote, maybe there was an alternative, maybe not, but they're <laughs> seeing the pendulum swing back. And so right. what you're seeing mm -hmm. is that productivity is being cited as something that's important. You don't need to be there five days a week, but you want to build culture and you want to create serendipitous interaction. You want to spark innovation. You're seeing YC on the other end of the spectrum start to bring their batches back into San Francisco. There's probably a little bit more middle ground rather than either end of the spectrum where things will kind of naturally balance out. And so finding the way to optimize your investment of talent in these markets. Yeah. That's, that's the mass that, you know, in a cost conscious environment that we now live in, uh, mm -hmm. those are decisions that you have to make and you have to kind of push your dollars even further. So yeah, again, it, it's not a one size fits all world that we're in, but I think the fact that it is so complicated means you have to have a better way to make these decisions. Yeah. What are some common, I guess, not pitfalls, but what are some common mistakes of companies will make regarding hiring talent? And is, is it long-term planning? Is it identifying if a certain location is actually the right pool of talent? Where are they missing in terms of, of the knowledge or, or what is the knowledge gap for them and some common mistakes that they make? I think it's not understanding them. Yeah. So it's very easy to say, well, I think there's university talent and so they must have great engineers or hey, I think that like Phoenix is known as a great customer support center, but you know, I don't have anything else to compare it to. So maybe we just go there. And then the world, again, just gets much more complicated. Yeah. So not every city is built the same way with the same number of companies, the same industry representation, the same functional representation. So yeah. you would make a different decision about your marketing funnel or your sales funnel based on all the data that comes in. And you would say, okay, well, we're going to target this area. We're going to do mail over here, we're going to do radio there, we're going to do outdoor yes. here, we're going to do online there. But you don't do that with talent. You kind of yeah. apply the same tricks. And so I think when you're in a different market, being able to understand, wow, I can spend top dollar in market A, 
and get two times better talent quality, where if I go into market B, I'm going to spend middle of the road or the same amount as in that other market and get half as good talent. We're not trained to think that way. You know, the, the tools haven't been there, but we will in time and you will say, okay, this is where I can go to successfully open and find data science or data analysts in biotech or enterprise customer support for this type of company in this location, this time zone and whatnot. Companies are just really pushing the boundaries on where they'll recruit because they want talent density. They don't need to have just one yeah. office. They don't need to have 500. They're finding that balance and then understand the, the dynamics of each market. That's yeah. where we're seeing really sophisticated companies begin to make really, really specific decisions about where they invest. Yeah. What are some key, I guess, identifiers that you see a company needing before they become someone that, that needs your service or businesses? What, what kind of, when are they at, at the point where they need to really start evaluating and understanding where the hiring market is for, for it to make sense? And is it a certain series round, a certain employee size, going into a certain particular market? What, when, when does a company know that they need to start investing in like a technology like Terrain? We see companies of all sizes. So we've yeah. worked with companies as small as like 100 or 150 people. And they're saying like, we want to move into a different market and kind of make our first foray. How do we think about it? Our sweet spot is probably a company slightly bigger, maybe a thousand employees where you've got multiple locations. But I really think again, like the what, no matter where you are on that spectrum, trying to understand where you can go compete most effectively for the talent that you want and optimize what you spend on it that's a best practice to develop as we go forward. The world is just like that global. We're going to have multiple markets that we operate in going forward. So trying to think about what your employer brand is, what the composition of talent is, what the industry representation is, whether there's the functional talent there. Uh, these are all just good questions to ask. Probably when you're like north of 50 people. Yeah. Uh, most companies that we talk to that are smaller and they're like, listen, we're 20 people. We'll hire anywhere. That's cool. At sure. some point you may say, we want to have like two to three approved locations. We want to be in mm -hmm. certain areas for the following reasons. It's easy to get together, whatever, be near customers. But the bigger you go, the more this discipline becomes evident. Yeah. Yeah. T t tell us a little bit about the traction that, that you're seeing at Terrain. How many companies are you working with? What, what are the sizes of those companies? And not only what's exciting about wh where you've grown to as of now, but what's exciting for the next kind of incumbent in, 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 the, in, the, in the future to come. Well, we're really excited about the future. I think we've kind of finally found that MVP, that product market fit. And so yes. we're in the process of scaling. We, we really try to be disciplined about who we target and what the use case is. Um, like I said, it's, it's typically a larger customer base for us, probably 500 and above. I think the sweet spot's really a thousand, but certainly those like breakout stage, late stage companies, they do hyper growth and everyone's thinking about where every dollar's going. So we've kind of identified tech and biotech as our two primary verticals. We yeah. tend to work with real estate as well. This concept of site location, uh, talent intelligence, this is an evolution of behavior that's existed for a long time. So we're just building our story to demonstrate here's where companies have expanded. Here's where companies have consolidated into. They had grown through m and They had too many locations. They're tapping out in certain markets. We hear stories like, hey, one of our clients, a top 20 life science company had employed a, a strategy consulting firm and they took them to the wrong market accidentally. They didn't know, but they didn't understand yeah. it's a single employer, didn't have the right talent. So they're reallocating budget because they have to now be in certain markets. Those are the things that we look for as we continue to grow. We're cresting into that seven figure ARR. We're well on our way with, with large customers, yeah. fortune 500, global 2000. I personally still like the growth stage companies because I spent so much of my career and yeah. perhaps and we're yeah. hearing companies are like, wow, all right, well, I can, I finally can move to Miami or I can think about Raleigh or I can think about yeah. Tallahassee versus, I don't know, like St. Louis yeah. or something. And, and startups are great at asking questions. So they're always kind of digging in, going deeper yeah. and deeper. And so to be able to provide the right level of insight, the right level of competitive intelligence, that's our mission. That's what we're following. And so that's yeah. where we're really kind of seeing traction from our go-to-market motion. Yeah. What are, what are some of the biggest challenges you face today? Building a brand. Um, 
how do you how do you put a brand on the map for the first time? And then how do you do it in a, an economy where everyone's kind of quick to say no and slow to say yes? Yeah. So we're getting very good at how do you frame a problem? When do you diagnose like the right time? But yeah, I mean, look, there's macroeconomic headwinds that I think a lot of other startups are facing. And we're just finding we're getting very creative in our deal making and our targeting in order to kind of overcome that and keep our growth trajectory going. Yeah. If everything goes well, what's the long term vision for Trend? We always think about it in terms of building an enduring, profitable business. Yeah. We get asked that question a different way, like, hey, what's your exit plan? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't work this hard to like exit the fifth the, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. overnight. I, I, I really like it. But I think if we do right for our investors and shareholders, we're going to build a viable long-term business that's profitable. It's a part of our DNA. We've, we've been really scrappy from day one. We bootstrapped. We know what we have to do to kind of be profitable. We didn't overinvest. We didn't overhire. We've proven the, the, the value to our customers. But one time, I think there's probably two paths right there. You either become a public company or you get acquired. But for us, it's still yeah. too early in the game to worry about that. We just sure. want to delight our customers. And we want to do right by our investors and, and build an enduring business. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I always like the next section because I call it my founder FAQs. And I'm going to ask you a bunch of rapid fire questions and and we'll see where we get. But first, first thing first is what's particular, particularly hard about your job? Oh gosh, I'm blowing the, the rapid fire. What's so, the there's a lot of unknowns. And okay. I think just having the patience and perseverance to work through things that may pop up in the day or may pop up at all that hadn't been thinking about and just figuring out how to do it. Cause so this is my first time as a software CEO. You, you discussed this part about brand and, and it's, and it's a, it's a haunting problem outside of most companies think about fundraising or building talent or finding product market fit. Outside of that, it is the, the brand component is so powerful because it, 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 it plays on the, the word of mouth phenomenon where you start to, to be a contagious company. What are some things that have been helpful in, in regards to building brand that, that uh, maybe you didn't expect first? I think. One of the best things that we did was outperform with the analytics that we could surface. Mm -hmm. We're in a world where it's very easy to rely upon what a friend said or what a different data source is. And yeah. so we have to provide insights that are above and beyond. Those end up being very memorable. And so we can then connect that back to a financial impact. And we do, we do quite well there. I think our... Yeah. Our UI is very clean. It's, it was pretty new. No one had seen what we had done before, but ultimately it was the leave behind. It was the impact of if you take, yeah. uh, if you take the terrain data and you apply it, does it have a material impact to your business? And we've been finding that our customers have been super happy with that and super happy that we go the extra mile through customer support. Yeah. We don't just leave them on their own. We really yeah. invest time with them. Yeah, it sounds like you, you take some of that service experience and, and build it into the, the life cycle of your customer, which I think is it's super powerful from some founders coming in from a service background because those relationships, especially early on and going from zero to one, influence and impact the, the one to 10 and, and how that kind of foundationally sets your company up for success. What are some ways that you stay motivated as a founder through the, the ups and downs of, of being a founder in, in this experience? Yeah, I don't have a hard time staying motivated. I think we've made representations to our investors and to our customers that we're a great long-term partner. And so I've always stood behind that personally. I, truthfully, like I care about my people yeah, tremendously. They've trusted me. They've trusted Riley. They trust that we're going to build something. And so mm -hmm. they've made a decision to work with us and not somewhere else. So every day I wake up and I look at the faces on the team and it's like, I don't find it particularly hard to like want to see them be successful yeah. and want to create this shared vision. Um, so that motivation's never been a challenge. And I think just loving the subject matter too makes it really easy. Like we, we yeah. picked something that we love about, but that we love that we talk about all the time. And it's a very topical conversation too. I mean, you go anywhere and you talk to people about what are you noticing about people coming or going and your city and. It's yeah. just easy to, to stay engaged with. So we have a lot of love and excitement for the topic and it, it keeps us focused yeah. on that point. Yeah. Being an experienced founder and especially a founder who's, who's worked with a lot of other founders as well is this for, for those early on in, in, in their experience as an entrepreneur, what, what are some, what is one piece of advice that you found particularly helpful early in your career that, that had stuck with you? So there's probably two, the two that I share the most frequently. One is um, 
follow the things that you love to do yeah. that you want to be great at. Because I think being great in this day and age requires extreme commitment, consistency, perseverance, grit. So, you know, if it's just not fun or not interesting, like pick something out. Life is too short. Yeah. And focus on the things that make you happy where you can really, it doesn't feel like you're applying effort to, you know, to, to be great. The second thing is find a great mentor. I'm mm. really lucky to have had a couple amazing mentors in my career, people that I go back to. I've got an incredible relationship with my board and my chairman. They're the ones that help me solve problems that I can turn to, that I can be vulnerable with and just say like, mm -hmm. this is a problem that I don't know how to solve. And so having that to draw down on for best practices, best experiences to help you open doors, probably my two best pieces of advice. Yeah. Yeah. Being that you've had such an, it was an experience working with founders and, and companies to you far and wide, what, what makes a, what key things makes a company successful? Is it, is it how they run their business strategically? Is it the culture? Is it how they view product? What are your, I guess, experience ha have you seen at a common, I guess, a commonality between companies that makes them successful? Is there anything or, or is there nothing? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think there's probably a number of things that can go into that recipe. I, I think a lot of it is the decision framework that you apply to finding what problem you're solving. I think it's the way that you motivate your people. Um, I think people want to be inspired. I think they yeah. want to believe, I think, especially very early at our stage, like sub 20 people, you're out there to change the world. You're, you're putting in really, really long hours. So it's the, it's the connection to the mission. It is the culture. I, and I think culture is what happens when the CEO is not in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you have a founder, it's like, oh, I know the culture. We do all this stuff. And then like you meet the team and like none of that happens. Like there's a big disconnect. We try to be really authentic. We, we've got some really weird quirks to, to our company that we embrace. Yeah. Aside from being like data nerds and startup junkies, we just really focus in on the things that are unique to us and that serve as a magnet to attract others that are like us. Yeah. And I think that it all contributes. Um, once you get like into the scale process, then I think a lot of it is like, how do you build best practices to create scalability and repeatability? Yeah. And those are things when your sales motion gets a little bit bigger and whatnot, you can kind of professionalize, but sure, it always evolves. It's a constant yeah. work. So yeah. Never yeah. Changes. If you were to have a magic wand, um, what's one thing you would wish for your company to have today, uh, rather than whether or not you can have it or can't have it or, or can't have it in the near future, what's one thing that you, you wish you had today? for your company? Five more great engineers. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on that. We, we've been blessed. We've, again, like I said, like we've had some great success with hires. We had some great success with investors. Um, yeah, I think every founder wants to go a hundred times faster than the pace yeah. that they're going. So we could do that. That would be great. But look, I, I would take a handful of engineers and we just continue to focus on building great product and making our customers happy. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I always like to ask this question as an insight to, to what influences you, what impacts you kind of not only early in your career, but also today, what books or people have influenced you? So many books. I think early on, I was really taken with books on competitive strategy. It just yeah. always kind of stood out to me, like how were great companies built? So I read a lot of Drucker early in life, some management consulting books on mindset management and understanding people. I've been particularly motivated lately by a bunch of sales books and customer success books. There's some really great ideas on framing and there's great ideas on repeatability. And then I tend to just stay on top of all the like blogs and whatnot too. So I'm a big fan of, I like the Saster blog, truthfully. I think there's just yeah. some like really great insights there. Jason does a really nice job, like very relatable to founders. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, I mean, that's kind of like a broader, broader cross section, but I'm an avid reader. So I'm, I've always got a couple of things on my bedside table that I'm reading. I love that. I love that. And I know we're at the, the, the close of the episode here and, and I'm sure we could go and just so many different topics from this point forward. But I always like to give our, our guests a chance to give us your plugs. Where can we find you? Where can we support you? What are your website? What are your LinkedIn? Where can the audience get involved in? Even if, if they're a founder growing a company, if they reach that, uh, that, that, that need to start really thinking strategically about where they're acquiring talent, where can they find you? Where can they, they get involved? Well, appreciate that. So yeah, terrainanalytics.com. That's our website. We're coming out with a new one in a few weeks. So 
Very excited for that. You can email me anytime, Mark at Terrain Analytics. You can find me on LinkedIn. We're we're out there. We're visible. So hit us up with questions. We're always happy to chat. Awesome. Mark, it's been such a pleasure not only learning about your background and your experience and what Terrain's doing, but I think you, you, kind of how, you, how you've experienced businesses building and the different advice and, and the different way that they can think more strategically. And, and, and you're right. Companies are being a little bit more slow to say yes and quick to say no, but I think it's all around being being very thoughtful about the decisions they make. And it's really cool to hear about how you're enabling companies to make thoughtful decisions, especially with talent, which is, which is as they say, the, the biggest indicator for success, which is hiring the right people and, and building products around that. So I hope you enjoyed yourself and thank you again for being on the show. I did. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. It's been great to chat with you. So thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you.